it's always a delight to be with you people. You are special to us, and I thank you. And I thank the Lord that he's let me come and share the time that we've had together. Not only this time, but a lot of times before. And at this point, I'm not sure there will be others. And that'll be a sorrow on my part if, if there's not. But I sincerely love you, people. Care for you. There are some words in our common language. I suppose it's common. I, I, I have real trouble determining <laughs> that it is, but <clears throat> there are some words in our common language that connote special meanings. Home, mother, There are some words that are just as strong as a negative. And one of those is the word failure. I don't care whether we're talking about a grade school kid who didn't make the right grade on his math test or the athlete who didn't make it to the finish line or the businessman who ends up in bankruptcy. But failure, just that's not a good word for us. I want to talk to you tonight for just a minute about this topic why Christians fail. And obviously that's the greatest failure of all. That's the real tragedy. All of us could quote Jesus' statement, what is man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his life? Failure. We do not want. Open your Bibles tonight to the book of 2 Peter. And the fact that it is named 2 Peter obviously tells us there is 1 Peter. And if you remember at all the discussion that pervades in the book of 1 Peter. It was that these Christians were undergoing some pressure. And soon, fiery trials were going to come among them. And Peter had written to them, urging them to hold on to their faith. The whole book of 1 Peter focuses on hold your faith, don't give up, punishment can come, a real fiery trial will come, and he's probably talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, not the end of the world, the destruction of Jerusalem and the various persecutions that were going to follow thereafter. And Peter is saying, don't lose your faith. Don't give up your hope. And that's the theme of the book of 1 Peter. Now he writes them another letter. And he begins by telling them, that God has granted unto us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us. And that, of course, is talking about Christ. Everything is 
invested in him. The Hebrew letter talked about God in times past speaking to the fathers, speaks to us today through his son. Who has it? Is at the position of the right hand of God, serving as our high priest. And Peter says, God has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through him that called us, according to his own grace and mercy, whereby he has granted unto us his exceeding and great promises that through these you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that was in the world through lust. How many times have you heard Christians reason about the spirit living in you and whether he does some miraculous way or, or not? Or does he, how do I feel? Or I hear the spirit talking and that kind of, no. The spirit dwells in us by the knowledge of God's word and the manner in which we become partakers of the God spirit is as we escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. The more you put away the corruption of the world, the more you put on the things of the Lord, the more God dwells in you. It's not some miraculous thing that out of the blue comes the spirit and jumps in your body somehow. It's a matter that you grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said that in 1 Peter 2. Now having said all of that, Peter said beside this, giving all diligence. Diligence is hard work. Not the soft way. The hard way. Beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith, the King James says. In your faith, supply, the American Standard says. So here's a matter that you have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to supplement it. Supplement your, your basic faith with these things. And I dare say that we could go around this room and get all of the things that Peter talks about without looking at the book. In your faith, supply virtue. I've spent a lot of time on college campuses, both where I went to school, where I've worked, where I've visited. There is a word that occurs over and over in the Greek societies, you know, all the different clubs and all of that. And that is the word arete. Maybe you've heard that term somewhere in some organization. But it's the Greek word for virtue. And virtue doesn't mean a, a boy or a girl who has never had sexual relations with somebody else. It's not that kind of virtue. Virtue is a strong, strong term in the Greek language that talked about character that is superb. It means the kind of character that stands at the bridge and defends it so other people can escape. The kind of character that is undoubting regardless of what comes along. Peter says, add to your faith virtue. Another description of it is moral 
excellence, moral excellence, standing for what is right, and in to your virtue, what are you going to add? In your virtue? No? Knowledge. Knowledge. Now Peter had already said that you gain all of these things through the knowledge of him that called you. But there is never a time for stopping in the development of knowledge in a Christian. And I'm not just talking about memorizing verses, but having the Word of God truly live in your life. And the only way that comes is by imbibing that Word. So you have to your virtue, faith. And to your faith, what do you add? And to your faith, you add virtue, virtue and knowledge, and then what? No, temperance. not next. Temperance. temperance. All right. King James says temperance. And again, we're not talking about liquor. It's another word for self-control. And I want you to think about that a minute. Self-control. I've got a key to a, some rooms at the hotel. What if I tell you, I'll just give you that property. It's a nice little uh, bungalow, really, next door to the to the main hotel. It's a wonderful place and we've enjoyed it. What if I tell you I'm going to give it to you? Well, I don't have the right to give it to you. If I had my car keys, which I don't have, I could lay them out and I could say, now, I could give you my car because I control it. I own it. I can't give you something that is not in control. When Paul said in, in Romans 12, present your bodies as living sacrifices, you can't do that unless you're in control of it. And control can, means everything from temper tantrums to the stability that comes because you are a person who is in control of yourself. You're not controlled just by the winds that come along or the words that may be thrown at you or some event that occurs. You're a person in control. And so Peter says, add to your faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and patience. What do you think of with patience? Well, I tend to think of the, the guy who can sit and the, the little child picks on him or the dog bites at his ankle and he doesn't get upset because he's very patient. No, that's not what this word means. Patience in this context, really means steadfastness. Steadfastness. You know Christians that are hot and cold? Sometimes show, sometimes don't. Sometimes they, they catch a spirit of the moment and they're active in the congregation and they're just doing everything and then the next thing you know I wonder where old Sam is nobody has seen him and you find out he's off the wagon in a sense not the Christian that is pleasing to God so you add stead fastness. Then to that 
you had brotherly kindness. That one has always bothered me because there's another one that comes right behind it, love. Well, what's the difference? Trust, actually, brotherly kindness is talking about love of the brethren. And some of the marginal readings give it that way. Love of the brethren. And have you ever thought about it? Every one of the epistles, I think I'm right on this. I don't remember any exception to this. Every one of the epistles has some significant attention to loving the brethren. wonder why. Is it because the folks that obey the gospel are pretty hard to get along with? Some of them are. Is it because some of them are not very attractive physically and you just don't like to be with them? Well, some of us are that way. <laughs> Is it because some don't behave too well? Well, that's true. A lot were mentioned like that in Scripture. I'll tell you. Love of the brethren captures the very idea of the local church. The local church as a family of believers who care for each other. I had one brother, no sister, and for the first few years of my life, I didn't love him too much, <laughs> because he was six years older than I, and he spent his time beating me up. And he'd use me as a punching bag and then say, if you tell mother, I'll do it worse to you next time. Finally, two things happened. Well, he went off to war. And we all worried about that. He was over here at D-Day. And by the time he came home from the service, his little brother had grown up. And I was as taller, taller than he. And we became fast, fast friends. We did things together. We cared for the same things. We were very, very close. And let me hurriedly say, he spent a lot of time apologizing to me for those early days when he would back me up in the corner and, and beat on me and then take the money that I had so he could go buy some coats or whatever he wanted, <laughs> wanted and, and all that. He apologized over and over and over for that, but that's what big brothers are for, <laughs> you know, is to teach the little guys and <laughs> where they come in. But I loved him dearly. And you know, he had a nickname. He got it when he was three weeks old and kept it to his death at age 88. He was called Sparky. And it was a perfect name for him. If somebody came and said, you know, Sparky did such and such, and it's bad, my first reaction would be, oh, I don't believe he did that. And my second reaction would be, if he did that, I'm sure he didn't intend to. And my third would be, if he did that, I'm sure he didn't intend to, and he would be anxious to, uh, to make amends for it. Now, why would I react that way? Be 
because he's my brother. And I love him. And like 1 Corinthians 13 about the description of love, love doesn't eagerly listen for bad things about others. Love seeks the good and assigns the good because you love. And I'm impressed by the fact that in the early church, God had to say to every congregation, love the brethren. You need to love each other. And some strong, strong language. Each of you counting the other better than himself. In honor preferring one another. Those strong words. That means for me to think of you before I think of myself. Not easy. And the selfish world does the opposite but families that love each other, care for each other, and put each other first. And finally, Peter says love. <clears throat> love for everybody. Love for God. Love for the brethren. Love for your neighbor. Love for the world. Love is the motivating force that brought Jesus to the earth and should be the motivating force that helps us carry his word to the world. Now, wait a minute. I said we were going to talk about failure and why Christians fail. Look at the end of that line in, in your Bibles in, first, in 2 Peter 1. Peter says, if these things be in you and abound, what does it mean to abound? Have a lot of it. Overflowing. Not just a smattering, but this is really the characteristic of you. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be idle nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's emphasized knowledge here. He says that through our knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have everything from God. Then he tells us to grow in that knowledge. And now he says, you can be unfruitful in your knowledge. Unfruitful means you don't do these things. You don't add these things. But if you add them, you will never fail. Uh-huh. Here we start with the success. But are you ready for it? Look at verse 8. But he that lacketh these things is blind, seeing only what is near, having forgotten, verse 9, having forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Why do Christians fail? I'm sure there's a long list of things that can cause failure. But Peter, through inspiration, has named two things that are just major, major causes for Christian failure. I want to start with the last one. 
having forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. To each of us, do you remember when you were baptized? Do you remember the day you were baptized? Mm -hmm. Were you like I was? For the next few days, that was all I could think of. I have now become a Christian. I'm now a Christian. When I get up in the morning, first thing I think of was, I'm now a Christian. Did you ever get a new toy? And that's all you could think of for a few days was that new toy. Then the new wears out. And the first thing you know, that toy goes over to the side and others take their place and your attention goes to everything else. Peter says, you know what? It is possible for a Christian to forget the cleansing of his past sins. I'm sure that's why the Lord has us come each Lord's day to the table with Jesus and commune with him and with one another, but commune with him, the Lord's Supper so that we go back to the cross and remember what Jesus did for us. Each time I've been here in Clarkston, I've been impressed that you give attention to the communion. The person who is going to serve Communion knows it well in advance. And in every case that I've heard, makes a special preparation. Trying to do something to help us as we commune, keep our thoughts on Jesus and really focus on that. Peter says, we need to remember that Jesus Christ died so our blood, our, our, his blood could cleanse us from our sins. And when you forget that, you lose that impact of appreciation, a sense of obligation, not duty, but the appreciation that grows. Because look what the Lord has done for us. What might cause us to forget the cleansing of our past sins? Look at verse 8. Seeing only the things that are near. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about my life getting tied up with the things of this world. Now we have to do that. We live here. But don't forget Paul's admonition in Colossians 3. If you be raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and mind not the things of the world. Peter says, you want to fail? Get your attention pointed at the things of this world and forget the things that are above. 
I guess one of the reasons I like to come to Scotland is because it's the home of golf. <laughs> Uh, right. And I love it. And I live in a golfing community. The little town that I live in is built basically around a golf course. And about three miles down the road, there's a little community um, there's not an upscale community most of the houses are very uh, small rather poor and all of that and the community is kind of a uh, low economic place there was a man that lived in that community who came to our golf course every day. And his name was Friday. And Friday would come every day and he would walk around the golf course and walk through the roughs in the golf course finding golf balls. At the end of the day, if possible, he'd sell them to the golfers there. And that's where he made his money. And he would walk back to his home. On several occasions, I've seen him walking and I've stopped and picked him up. Because I know where you'd be going, whether it's coming or going. And on several occasions, I've had this experience. Friday would be walking along, looking down. I never saw him look up. He would be looking down. <laughs> if you stopped and said, hey, you want to ride? And he opened the door and got in. He still didn't look up. He'd get in and he'd say something like, I found 12 balls today. Or I found 15 balls today. When you got to the place where he got out, he'd get out. He'd usually mutter thanks, but never look up. To me, Friday was always looking for golf balls. How many of us spend our lives looking in the rough for golf balls and failing to look up? Peter said, you want to fail? Get so involved in the things of the here and now that all you see is what's near what I'm going to do tomorrow what my job is whether I can earn a vacation whether I can get this whether I can have this promotion whether I can get that new car whether we move to that house you think only about the here and now and you forget the cleansing of past sins and your appreciation for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he took about four verses to talk about how to succeed. And in two quick verses, he found out how to fail. I want to close with this thought. It doesn't take a lot to fail. It takes a lot to succeed.
my prayer is that we will add faith and virtue and knowledge. That we will add those things that God wants us to have. That our self-control will be true. And our steadfastness will be real. And our love for the brethren will not be false, <clears throat> genuine, and our general love for mankind will lead us to become partakers of the God life spirit. May God bless us.